गुड इवनिंग हो हेलो 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 गुड इवनिंग मा हेलो गुड इवनिंग कैन हियर यू गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग कोलीग सो यू आर ऑल वेलकम टू दिस इवनिंग प्रेजेंटेशन um from us is Mary and Mr. Oni the moderator of this presentation and our presenter this evening is uh, Dr. Timmy Pre Okero Gene Agogo and the topic she will be presenting this evening is benign prostatic hyperplasia is a case study can you please all listen watch me mix up make a presentation thank you very much pharmacist miriam is uh, onilu i'm highly honored to be here this evening i just want to remind the house that sometime around june we had this presentation benign prostatic hyperplasia but the presentation that we had then was with dr solomon owafuru he gave us a deep in depth on the understanding of the management of um, you know dph and he explained in um, details the epidemiology pathophysiology even the pharmacotherapy that has to do with um, single dose therapy and also the combination dose therapy he also tried to explain the mechanism of actions of you know each of these drugs and um, while it will be suitable sometimes to use the combination therapy and he emphasized also some of the advice that we can give to our patients that, that have this um, you know, condition. That means we as pharmacists, we also have to know the signs, the symptoms, and some of the presenting uh, um, conditions before we can actually give advice. So he even went as far as explaining to us um some non some non pharmacological um things that we can actually do that are not drugs uh, i remember it was them um, explaining some things they can eat when they get to certain ages um certain um, age so these are some of the things that we enjoyed in that june presentation from the urology pharmacist of uh, you know nigeria yupon so what i am doing now is just a case study I, uh, I am trying to uh, present to us a case study to kind of um, understand what we were taught by Dr. Solomon Uwafuru then in that June presentation. And then um, the case study that we have today, it's, um, from a 78 year old uh, man. And I've already given it a title, the case of Mr. B.O. and the urina of, of doom. So, like I said earlier, we are expected, Mr. B.O. Is a, is a retired class teacher. He presented at, at the tertiary care hospital with lower urinary tract infection. So we are expected from this case study to be able to direct the evaluation. We should be able to, um, 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 also know about the education and also how are we going to manage these, these you know, patients. So, like I said earlier, I was trying to draw, atten draw our attention to the presentation we had in June with Dr. Solomon Uwafuru. And I also want to encourage us that we should try and get the slides and also read, read up. This presentation is a follow-up to that presentation. Now, um, the learning objectives, we want to find out how we can identify the major anatomic and histologic features of the, of the, of the prostate gland. How we can identify the location where this prostate, where it actually develops and want to describe how it relates to the signs and the, and the symptoms of you know, BPH. Sometimes we may want to wonder why we want to know. Knowing the signs and symptoms, uh, symptoms can always help us in our, um, you know, intervention. Because if a patient does not present with certain signs and symptoms, and then they are uh, they are prescribing some kind of medication, we have a role to actually play. Then we should be able to define what DPH is and also list the signs and also the symptoms. 
we should be able to describe the natural history and any distinctive epidemiology features of um, you know, BPH. That's why I did mention that when Dr. Solomon Uwafuru took us on this um, course, he explained to us some of these epidemiology uh, features. Sorry, I just want to mute some people who are just coming in. The, the background noise is actually more, uh, much. So I don't want to mute everybody. I'm just muting the people coming in now. Yes, yeah, so we should also be able to list the important com components of the history and the physical examination when we are evaluating the patient that comes with BPH. We know that the physicians, especially in the hospital setting, are the ones that actually do this examination. But as pharmacists, do we have a role to play? Then we also we also need to list what laboratory, radiology, or aerodynamic tests that should be ordered in a patient with a, you know BPH. This is very important because sometimes they can just be wasting time on a patient um, just prescribing. If this drug does not work, they change to the other. Does it really um, end there? Don't you think that this patient may need uh, you know surgery? So that is how why we need to understand that part then we should also leave the indications for the treatment of uh, BPH, their side effects and, their, and the mechanism by which this um, medication work. And we should be able to list and also briefly describe the surgical treatment options. And then um, this, and we should also be able to know when a patient with BPH should actually be referred to a uh, urologist. Urologists are uh, special uh, uh, physicians that are actually specialize in that aspect of um, you know medicine. They don't just go to the general practitioners. If at the end of the day they they are seen by the general practitioner, they should be referred to a urologist if it is necessary. So, um, Mr. B O visits at the uh, at the general outpatient of the tertiary hospital. Like I said, he's a 78 year old male, a job by tribe, and he's a Nigerian. He's a Christian, married, and living with his 62 year old wife. But on this day, he presented at the general outpatient of the hospital along with his 42 year old son. But one distinctive thing about him that he was walking with a with a with a limp. He was kind of limping, and he was carrying a plastic urinal on his belt. And then um, when he was questioned by the, by the physician, he stated that, um, that um, he has been extremely bothered over the last few, few, few months with the need to always urinate every half, half, half hour, hour to hour. And he's also not able to leave his home except he carries that his plastic urinal with, with him all, all the time. So the physician, from what he told him and with the examination, he concluded that he must be suffering from Denied prostatic hyperplasia. My, my so the issue now is what are the signs? What are the symptoms? What do we look out for? What do we as a as, uh, pharmacist look out for? If you look at this particular slide, you see background pictures. These are pharmacists and then uh, nurses and then uh, physicians. They, they are doing a kind of collaboration. They are looking at the case notes. Somebody needs to find out if this patient actually needs, um, if um, some of these things that this patient said could actually be BPA. Because like we said before, the physician already concluded that um, this uh, patient must be suffering from BPH. Now, obstructive sim symptoms is, is, is one very important symptoms that um, we should look out for. Did the patient complain that um, unlike before, now he's having a kind of weak, you know, stream, intermediate flow, that means a flow as he's trying to urinate, it's kind of breaking and he's also straight to urinate, complete emptying. That means even after urinating, he still feels that he still wants to urinate. Then we have the irritative symptoms where frequency, urgency, Noctura. You see this uh, person uh, always, you know, he goes to urinate just now, he's going again, and again and again he's going, and you can imagine what will happen throughout, throughout the night for this patient. This patient will not sleep well, because every time he has to, because there's incomplete emptying and he feels that there's still something left. Now, there are other symptoms, which is the lower urinary tract symptoms. These are not specific, although 
for BPH, for instance, mm -hmm. where you have the uh, ureter stri stricture, these ones can also cause obstructive sim symptoms. And uh, also when you have, well, they have in bladder tumors, that one can also cause irritative symptoms. But specifically, we can say um, that is one of the signs you look out for for BPH. Then another very common sign is um, hematuria, where you have blood in the in the in the urine, and then um, some of them you have to use the microscope to. Sorry, let me let me mute again some persons. Is it actually I want to because those just entering now they they are leaving their mic on. I'm using so can i also use this opportunity to plead with um uh our pharmacists to please mute their mic if they are not talking thank you to reduce the background noise Please, pharmacist, um, doctor, okay, um, okay, yeah, I've done that. I just muted everybody and then unmuted myself instead of doing it one one. Thank you. So um, we said that hematuria is also one of the very, very common signs where you have blood in the, in the urine, but sometimes they have to use the microscope to see if it is not too so significant. But um, uh, blood in the urine for uh, greater than three to four red blood cell counts can show, can, can actually, in this kind of case, we can actually refer the, person, the patient to the urologist for a hematuria workup to rule out cancer. We want to note here that, uh, although I will come to that later, but uh, post cancer and benign prostatic apoplasia are two very different things. In fact, BPH is not a risk factor for post cancer. It is not. I will show you with the diagrams to see the difference. Now, what should what Mr. Bio should should um, should they know? Now we've talked about he has been um, from 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 what he has explained. The physician has actually concluded that he must have BPH. But now, what should he know? He should be told that he's actually suffering from uh, BPH, and it's a very common disorder in uh, you know elderly males. It is detected histologically in 70% of, of, uh, of men aged 70 and 90% of men aged 90. And he was also made to understand that the, that, the, that the progression of this microscopic hyperplasia can actually result in enlargement of the, of the post-trade. So that means it is estimated that out of um, one out of four, four men will have a significant urinary symptoms from BPH in their lifetime. That is, we are talking about 25%. So, uh, so there is nothing to panic. If we have somebody that is just newly diagnosed, there is nothing to panic there is to assure him and reassure him and let him know that it is something that can happen within the age. Remember this, our patient is a 78 year old man. So his age, we have been told that 70% of men age 70, can actually um, uh, come down with this condition in their lifetime. Now, where in the post does BPH occur? Where does it occur? I, we said before that BPH um, is different from um, post cancer, and then we don't want to mistake it or feel that BPH is a, is a uh, um, how do I put it, is a, a risk factor, no for post cancer. Sorry, the picture um, at the background slide, we, um, it is kind of fainted, but you can see if you, if you, if you stream. 
you can see that BPH develops in the transition zone of the of the, of the prostate, which surrounds the urethra. Now the prostate is there surrounding the urethra. The urethra is actually that um, gland that um, um, that um, that urine passes from the from the bladder. So um, when the when the prostate actually gets enlarged, when the glands actually get en enlarged, it squeezes that urethra, squeezes it so hard. And when this happens, the urethra becomes um, the, the, the urine can no longer flow easily again. And so this is what makes it when uh, they have the urge to go and urinate, nothing comes out. Or sometimes they have already urinated. When they go, they have a serious urge, but then when they go, they have just little emptying. By the time they want to go back, they still feel the urge again. That's because the prostate is as um, you compress the urethra, which is uh, supposed to, um, which is where the urine is supposed to pass. But when it comes to prostate uh, prostate cancer, that one tends to develop at the at the at the periphery of the gland. So if you look at the picture very well, you will see it. the prostate cancer is developing at the periphery of the gland. So it doesn't even connect at all unlike the benign prostatic apoplasia, which is the whole of the prostate, which gets enlarged, enlarged, grows to the point that it begins to squeeze the urethra. So it's two different things. So uh, it actually occurs when the cells of the prostate gland begin to multiply. And this additional cells causes the prostate gland near the urethral lumen to swell. And as a result, it squeezes the urethra, which travels through the prostate and then limits the flow of the of the of the urine. So what they what they do in the hospital setting sometimes uh, in the outpatient is to do a digital rectal examination. It's an effective screen for prostate cancer too because the majority of the prostate cancer develop at the peripheral of the gland near the near the rectal wall where it can be palpated. But this is not the case with uh, BPH since it is the growth of tissue near the urethra which results in the urinary symptoms. So why many men with BPH may have large prostrates? Digital rectal examination is not very accurate means by which to assess the severity of the, of the urethra obstruction. So you can see that all these diagnoses also have their own limitations as well. Now, what else do we do? We will find out that uh, yes, this uh, patient has this enlarged prostrate unlike this, patients particularly him is even limping is limping so that shows that um, um his prostate will, is really enlarged and then um, like he like he complained from the beginning the frequency of the way he goes to urinate has made him decide to see the physician so what further questions can we learn about his urinal status and to rule out other causes of his urinal symptoms? The physician asked Mr. B.O. further questions to learn more about his urinal status and to rule out other causes of the urinal symptoms. He asked him, like, does anything, including over-the-counter medication, make his urine, uh, urinal symptom better or even, even worse? Has he ever had an episode of urinary retention before that time? Does he have any dysuria that's painful or difficult to urination or history of um, urinary tract infection? Does he have diabetes or other neurological disorder which can result in bladder dysfunction? Does he have any history of ureter stricture or sexual tra transmitted disease? Remember we said ureter stricture can also cause obstruction. Then has he ever had any previous endoscopy or surgery of the urinary tract? Because that can also result in a stricture anywhere or any kind of tumor that can make it difficult for urine to flow easily. But Mr. Bio responded that his past medication history is notable only for Sudafed, that is a pseudo -ephy dream just a week back when he got his the, uh, sniffles after hanging out and currently he's not on any medication. That drug he took was just over the counter medication. Now, you know, so many people are on a, um, um, traditional things. So we really need to ask the, so the doctor asked all this question in order to find out, in, in, in order to rule out other causes of his urinary symptom. 
Now, what would make Mr. Bio have more trouble passing urine? What would make him have more trouble? The prostate has a significant amount of smooth muscles innervated by alpha adrenergic nerve. So sim simulation of this nerve can cause the prostate to contract around the urethra, leading to an exacerbation of obstructive sim symptom. So taking a drug like pseudo ephedrine, a decongested, uh, a decongestant pill can worsen BPH symptoms because what they do is that they actually tighten the muscle in the in the in the in the prostate and and the bladder neck. And when the muscle tightens, the urine cannot easily leave the bladder. And this can put the man in suffering from prostatic enlargement into complete urinary retention. So you can just understand what this patient is going through, taking a drug like that. So like I said, I said, um, one of the presentations we had in June, when we talked about benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, when Dr. Solomon Uwafu um, presented and he was giving us details, these were some of the things he was trying to tell us that we must advise our patient that some medication they should not use when they have that condition. Because all men with BPH, they should avoid medicines that can worsen symptoms or cause urinary retention. Those ones are anti-histamine. Most of our cold, uh, uh, some cold, uh, you know, medicine, some of our cough syrup, some of them have this. So, they contain um, diphenylhydramine and decongestant, like we've just said before. It can worsen, but you are taking it over the counter. We can imagine why he said every hour he has, every half an hour he has to get up and go, go and go, and that's why intervention um, question from the from the physician actually made him know that this patient has been on other, even though he has no he has no condition. Uh, anything that's making him take drug regularly, but he has taken a drug that, that, that can worsen that. So Mr. B, oh, you, he did uri urinalysis too, and he showed no evidence of infection or hematuria, and his post-void residual urine is low, is 15 mil. I'll explain that when we get to diagnosis. Now, further examinations to learn more about his urinary status and to rule out other causes of his urinary symptoms. On physical examination, um, they found out that uh, it has no costal vertebral angle tenderness. I tried to um, even get a video that described how this is done on physical examination, but I said, let, let me just put the picture. Um, the, the, the picture you see at the background of the slide, you, 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 you will notice um, um, the physician is trying to palpate this particular patient is at the back, but a pain in this area may indicate a kidney, a kidney infection, a back problem, or another kind of internal problem. So that is why um, this kind of examination is done. And his bladder does not feel distended on, on um, palpation or, or, or percussion. His genital ex exam is also normal. So why that is necessary is that why the prostate is enlarged and this particular patient is actually leaping, Examination is done on that and on that particular area, the genital examination, to see if there is any other thing, any other um, thing that could that can actually um, cause more issue for him. Then the digital rectal, we we already said that sometimes it doesn't give you the accurate thing that you need to know, but it is it is it is used uh, uh, because of differential diagnosis. Digital rectal examination reveals that the prostate is about four centimeter in a in a in a in a breadth, smooth and non-tender with no with no nodules. So on neurologic uh, exam examination, Mr. Bio anal sphincter tone and his perineal sensation is actually normal, and his um, sacred reflex that is his nail ankle jets are also intact. So examination is not just only on that particular place. Where, uh, where it is, you can find, you can see that examination is done all around to find out that uh, this patient is actually doing well. Of course, we know vital signs too, we are taking to find out how his blood share, his, his, um, his blood, um, his um, blood, uh, you know, pressure and also uh, blood sugar is also taken to find out if the patient has any other condition so that um, they can treat. So what further evaluation should be performed by the physician on Mr. Bio to work up 
is likely BPH. Well, there is what they call the IPSS, is the International post Symptom Symptom Score. It's just like a questionnaire. It, it, the, the patient is asked some questions and then the patient just uh, filled it, fills it. It's just to monitor the impact of the of the of the therapy. It's a short validated questionnaire which can be, which can document the baseline severity of lower u- urinary tract symptom. So ur- urinalysis is also performed. That one is to find out if um, infection has actually set him and also to assess if there is immaturia. We talked about blood in the u- urine. Then there's a voiding diary. This is recorded by the patient. It is recorded by the patient of the volume and timing of oral fluid intake and urination can also be taken. This one is helpful to rule out other causes of lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, for, for example, we have people who take a lot of water, excess volume of water. So we want to find out if it is not connected to why it's always going to urinate. Because um, an excess volume of the urine produced at, at night may indicate that uh, also may indicate that the, that the patient has congestive heart failure and it's mobilizing peripheral fluid while sleeping fine. That is why they check for every other thing, even though what the patient came to complain is different. You've seen situations where patients are brought to the to the clinic and maybe with the patient relative, and then you hear the patient relative said, we came for this issue. Why is the physician asking us to do this and do that? It's just wasting our, our time. We try to explain that all these tests, all these diagnoses, all these uh, um, the measures carried out is to ascertain if there are no other conditions so that is for kind of differential diagnosis because for this patient somebody with congestive heart failure can also be mobilizing peripheral fluid and in the morning or during at, during at night may also be uh, going to urinate then it can also tell if the frequency or the noctura is due to excessive oral fluid intake i said that before because some uh patients some some persons drink water a lot a lot so so uh, there is differential uh, diagnosis to find out if it is as a result of the excessive fluid intake or or is the um, lower urinary tract symptoms associated with bph now, this voiding diary, it is the patient that actually records it. Eh? And uh, it, it, like he was able to tell, he was, you can notice that he told us, he told from the beginning that every half an hour he was always going was the reason why he felt he should see the physician. It was getting so much and he was getting consigned. And uh, so we can, it can actually be measured to know the quantity and then um, and the how long, what is the time duration. Now, the measurement of serum creatinine level, although it is a very useful test to rule out renal insufficiency, after all, we talked about the, uh, the, the palpating that we help us discover because pain in that area, we, uh, we, we, we make us know if this patient has problem with his, with his uh, kidney. So that serum creatinine level test is very useful due to obstructive uropathy, but it is not a good first-line screening test. This means that um, if the patient has financial constraint, we should do, we should recommend tests that are that are first-line tests that are very, very important before um, um, this one. But it is also important, but it's not a first-line screening test. Now, what further evaluation should be performed by the physician on Mr. B to work up is likely BPH. There is urophlometry, that's measurement of the urine flow flow rate. This one will help to assess this, the severity of the of the BPH because a low flow flow rate is not very is not very specific though, since it can cause urethral obstruction or very poor bladder. Contrality. contractility. So the, uh, the flow rate is actually measured. You will see, um, mm, let me use an example, a child of um, a boy of um, 10 years old starts to urinate by the side of a man of 70. When they start to urinate, you find out that the, the flow rate, the rate at which that child of 10 years will, will go, his urine will even go far than somebody who is um, 70. 
Mm. Sometimes it becomes so low to the point that at the end of the day, it may come so low, it may even stain um, the 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 inner way of the of the of the man. So that's to tell you. So this measurement is actually taken in order to rule out. Uh, to to find out because if it is less than 10, 10 mil per, per, per seconds, it calls for attention. Then like we said, there's always differential diagnosis to rule out BPH from urethra obstruction that could occur from a stricture or any kind of tumor. Then post void residual measurement becomes necessary. If the, if the, if the physician is concerned about incomplete emptying or urinary retention. So there is placement of the urinal catheter upon completion of voiding and measuring a low PVR or less than 50 mil can help to rule out this problem. So this measurement can be performed by a trans abdominal ultrasound. Unfortunately, the PVR again is not, is uh, unreliable due to large amounts of variability within individuals. Then we have the urodynamic testing. This one uh, is performed by the urologist. Uh, it is by this case, by this time, the, um, the general practitioner may have referred this patient. So this is performed and this can be very helpful to determine the capacity, the compliance, the controllity of the bladder, as well as assessing the degree of obstruction. This test is usually reserved for those patients who have failed medical therapy for uh, BPH and maybe considering surgical therapy for BPH or have potential neurological et etiology of the urinary symptom. So, like I said, the IP, I, IPSS, the Mr. BO completes the, the um, questionnaire and what it documented showed he had moderate to severe urinary symptom. Now, what is the most appropriate next step in Mr. Bio's management? I said, when we had this lecture then in June, Dr. Solomon Wafuru helped us to understand that pharmacotherapy, sometimes they, they, they go on just one medication, but sometimes they do combination, why? Now, the first line medical therapy for BPH is an alpha blocker, such as the teratosine, dexazosine, and tamsulosine. Very, very common. The most common one is tamsulosine. How does it work? It works by antagonizing alpha adrenal receptor in the body and relaxes this postratus smooth muscle, therefore, thereby facilitating the op opening of the postratic urethra. You know, we said that what happens in BPH is that there is contraction, contraction, and this contraction we now squeeze the urethra and then urine can no longer flow freely. But what this drug does is to relax it. And when it relaxes it, you find out that the opening becomes free and then urine um, flows freely. There are so many patients who are just on this drug, either tamsulosine, terasosine, or dexasosine. They are not on combination drug. Only this works for them. What about those that it fails? There is finasteride, which is a 5-alpha uh, reductorase inhibitor, reductors inhibitor, which inhibits by blocking the formation of the dihydrotestosterone and re results in shrinking of the volume of the, of the, of, of the post -treat. If you look at the background of this slide, that's what I have there. I'm trying to, I try to uh, let us have a picture of the mechanism of action of this drug. So what this does is that um, the testosterone um, action of the by converting it to dihydrotestosterone, and um, the you find out that the, the prostrate volume will now will now reduce, and when this happens, the opening we will, will also be now will now be free. Recent data suggests that this drug can reduce the rate of urinary retention in long-term users of the, of, the, of the medication, but it is usually not considered as the first line therapy for PPA, but it works best with significantly enlarged prostrate. So Mr. B.O. does not need a urodynamic evaluation at this time, since he does not have any underlying neurological abnormality. We said he was observed, but, um, but, but not filled Medic, but um, 
He has also not failed medical therapy and is not considering surgical treatment. Surgical therapy for BPH is definitely an option, but medical therapy is, is generally tried first, no matter the size of the uh, portrait of the portrait. They always try the medical therapy first. So in, indications for surgery for BPH include failure of medical therapy, patients de desire to avoid medication and reoccurring urinary retention. Because sometimes when they leave the drug, this there is always reoccurring, there's always obstruction. And so they may not like it. Some patients don't want to go through that stress. And so they just opt for say, please, is it possible? Can you do surgery for me? Let me be free. But there are some that want to be on the drug to help them to maintain, uh, uh, to have such free urinary flow and then they'll be free from any kind of side effect. So the physician decides to start Mr. Bio on the alpha blocker tamsulosin and he plans to start him on at 0.2 milligram to take 30 minutes after meal per aura every night at bedtime. Why every night? It's not compulsory, it must be every night, but this drug is better at bedtime because in order to minimize the chances of getting dizzy or fainting over the next few years, yeah, few, few weeks. Most times when they just start someone with the drug, they, this side effect of dizziness and fainting comes up. And it's so a postural hypotension. Sometimes when they get up suddenly, they feel like fainting. And so they start with a, with a lower dose. You know that tamsulosin comes in 0.4 milligram, but they started with a 0.2 milligram with the intention that it will slowly be increased to 0.4 milligrams, 30 minutes after meal per oral every night at bedtime. Now, what is the most common? We as pharmacists, this is our area. What's the common side effect of alpha blocker therapy for BPH and the side effect about which Mr. Bio should be counseled to stop the medication or to reduce the dose? Now, we talked about dizziness. That is one very, very common symptom. And we don't want to, we don't advise anybody to take this drug when the person is, um, uh, in fact, research some, um, some scholars feel that this drug should be discontinued when side effects like dizziness comes up, that it should be, others feel that the dose should be reduced because apart from dizziness and feeling like fainting, there's always headache, fatigue, nausea. But some other scholars have also said that sometimes stopping the drug, stopping the drug, the effect is even worse than continuing it like that. So um, these are different studies that have been carried out. But research also shows that for somebody who is elderly, like the age of this, my patient, 78 years old, it is not good to continue him with that drug. If, if, if he has that kind of symptom with his age because he's elderly and also, you know, frail, he should discontinue the medication. So when we notice such thing, probably I said he came in, he has, he's living with his 62 year old wife, but he came in with his 42 year old son. Although this patient was very active, he was the one talking and, you know, all that, but we can also um, counsel all those who living ar around him in case they, you know, notice him like that, they should, report back and this drug should be discontinued. We cannot manage that kind of situation for this kind of, this age. So recently he became drenched in uh, urine as his plastic urine now tipped off. And the physician felt that this drug is not really doing the work. It's not doing the work because if the tamsulosin was working well, I said he started with 0 0.2 milligram and he did, he, did, he, did, he, did, he did not have any of these symptoms. He was not dizzy, he wasn't feeling fainting. So even though we told the family to look out for it, so he was on it. So with time, he now titrated it up to 0 0.4 milligram every night at the uh, you know, bedtime. But he was still having the excessive urine and all that. So the physician felt at this point, this patient should be referred to the urologist for further evaluation and treatment of his symptoms. So the urologist repeats, and uh, when it was when it was actually referred, the uh, urologist repeats thorough history and physical examination and agrees with the finding of what the general practitioner did. And since the symptoms did not improve much with alpha blocker therapy, the, the urology 
perform a urodynamic evaluation, which confirms that his symptoms are due to obstructions from the prostate and not from the neurological problems or poorly contracting bladder. So what would potentially be an appropriate procedure for Mr. B.O.? Surgery. Because when drugs are not working or when drugs are ineffective or greater than 20 uh, NG per, per me, we are talking about the uh, PSA, now the post-trait, um, or, or we have um, the post size as 30 gram per uh, size surgery. It may, we may need to do a surgery. The, the physician may need to, the urology may need to do so. So at, at this point, the general practitioner is no longer involved, he has referred. So what kind of procedures? We have the, an, an outpatient procedure. We also have an inpatient procedure. For the outpatient procedures, those ones are non-invasive and they are minimal, uh, you know, uh, this thing, inversion. So there is trans, Uretral needle ablation, which they call the tuna, they use radio waves to scan and shrink the prostate tissue. And there's also transuretral microwave therapy, CUMT, using microwave energy to eliminate prostate tissue. Then the inpatient procedure, procedure, this patient will be admitted and small surgery will be performed where there's transuretral resection of the prostate, CURP. Is a traditional gold standard therapy to relieve the post the prostatic obstruction from BPH. And then you have the open simple postratectomy. It's an effective procedure per performed through an incision in the lower abdomen. And it is generally reserved for patients with very large post We're talking about 100 grams, greater than 100 grams. So radical postratectomy would, would not be indicated since this is done especially for post-trade cancer. So now Mr. Bio with the urologist and what is the outcome of his evaluation? The urologist saw the need for, the, um, for this patient, Mr. Bio, to carry out the TUMT. No, to, to carry out the TURP. Now the urologist discussed the therapy option in details with him. But he refused because um, he, he refused to undergo the transuretral microwave te uh, thermo te thermotherapy because it reminded him of a torture technique used on him 40 years ago. So it, he now decided to do a TURP. So but after obtaining the cardiac and medical clearance, you know, his age, his age is 78 years old, the TURP procedure was done for him without any difficulty. And uh, following the removal of the catheter, the lower urinary tract symptom improved dramatically. Now, as I'm talking to you, Mr. B.O. can go about without his plastic urinal on his belt. After now, he has to be monitored for effectiveness and improvement, advice to continue his um, medications. He has, we have to assess him for symptoms, improvement. Uh, we have to repeat uroflometry at bothersome uh, baseline. If there's any one done and it has bothersome uh, baseline, it has to be repeated. And uh, there are some, if he's given an alpha-1 adrenergic um, antagonist uh, and much outcome is not seen, it can be, those can be adjusted, but not for extended release formulation. Then we said, besides effects, we have to watch out for all of them. The malaise, the headache, ejaculation disorder will occur while taking the, the, the drugs, nasal congestion, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. So annual repeat of the uh, post-trade post -trade specific ant antigen PSA should be done. And even the digital rectal examination and the post-trade needle biopsy can be done from time to from time. time, to time. Maintain. So in conclusion, in conclusion, we'll say BPH usually presents with lower urinary tract symptoms, which can be obstructive and also 
irritative in nature. These symptoms are not specific to BPH, although we've mentioned before there are some differential diagnoses that will make us say, yes, this is BPH. Then it is a very com it is a very common cause of hematuria, but hematuria still mandates a fairer. Sorry, let me sorry, let me Then the initial evaluation of BPH should include a thorough history and physical completion of an IPSS questionnaire, a urinalysis, and also avoiding diarrhea. Then the first line medication therapy for BPH is an alpha blocker. This one helps to relax the postratic uh, smooth muscles. And we do not want to forget that dizziness is one of the most common side effects, and this may require discontinuation of the medication or reduction in dose. If we reduce the dose and it's good for the patient, fine, patient can continue. But even after all that is not good, we have to discontinue. Finasteride is a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, which can reduce BPH-related symptoms by reducing the volume of the postrate. You can see that the mechanism is different from the alpha blocker. Then patients with BPH should be referred to a urologist if they fail medical therapy and have a potential uh, neurological cause of their symptoms or are considering surgery therapy, then transuretral restriction of the prostate is the gold standard procedure for the treatment of BPH. Open radical post prostatomy is, the, is a cancer evaluation and not indicated for benign prostatic hyperplasia. I, these are my references, like I said, because um, we had a lot of um, discussion with Dr. Solomon Uwafuru, who uh, so, so I use this material as well. So it's there as one of my reference too. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored for having been um, asked to present. Thank you so much. Wow. Well done, Dr. Dimitri. This is a exercise, very detailed presentation. Well done, and thank you so much. The floor is open now for questions or if I thought there's any suggestion, addition to the presentation. Hello, can you hear me please? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can. Hello. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you, we can hear you. Any question, an addition to me to the presentation, the floor is open. Hmm. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Thank you, um, Dr. Timmy, for the presentation. Thank you, the moderator. Please, moderator, um, I wish that anybody that will want to ask a question should raise their hand, like two other persons have raised their hands, so that you call them based on how they raise their hands. Thank you. So that it will maintain order in the house. Thank okay. you. Thank you. My two people are raising their hands. Can you call them? Hello, the moderator. Can you unmute and okay? okay. Thank you. You can speak on. Hello? Can Dr. Ugene one? Yes, good evening, colleagues. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much, uh, our uh, uh, Assistant National Secretary, Dr. Timmy, for the excellent presentation. Um, my, my, um, Question is simple. Um, what is our pharmaceutical care focus? I, I know these days they say role is the fittest. What's our pharmaceutical care focus? I mean, um, in the management of uh, BPH, uh, taking into consideration that 
uh, most of the uh, most of the management are uh, medically based. So uh, what are we looking at uh, holistically? Uh, that's that's some, my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, should I respond, moderator? Yes, um, respond. Okay. So respond, the truth is that, you know, I did mention that um, those of us in the hospital setting, we actually have, um, when the patients come in, they see the physician. And then uh, those of us that go to ward rounds, we see the cases and then we begin to go along with the physician. One of the slides that I shared was I shared collaboration with other healthcare team. I shared a slide that has um, the physicians, the pharmacists, and even the nurses looking at the folder. Now, when it's good for we, for us to know the signs, to know the symptoms, this is good because um, when you are able to understand it, you will be able to know when certain drugs are given, uh, given the dose and all that, you can be able to intervene. You can intervene. So, but if you, if the part of physiology, you don't know much about it, like where BPH develops. Hmm? Somebody can even come to a community uh, setting, community pharmacy setting, for instance, you know, you can do a little physical examination because you know where the BPH occurs, you know the area. You are able to distinguish whether it is a BPH or or is not then of course definitely you are you are you are going to refer to the hospital where except when the patient comes for a a, a refill in in a committee setting then our intervention should come to be uh, what they are taking are they taking it well is there are there runs and then and then all that but uh, it is important for us to know this deep the histology, the anatomy, the pathophysiology, uh, signs and symptoms, so that we can help somebody that comes down. We've said that there are other conditions that 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 um, you know resembles it, resembles BPH, and you, we don't want to conclude it is. And then we can see some patients taking wrong medication, wrong medication probably because. Uh, the, the physician feels that that is the condition and is giving the drug. And if you can detect that, that that is not the condition, you can actually intervene. And there are so many cases like this have been have, have, uh, be held when uh, pharmacists make their research and then they go and consult with the, politely consult with the, with the, with the physician handling the case. And then they look at it together and then they now change therapy. So pharmacists has a lot to play especially in the hospital setting. Let's not feel that because um, uh, this case is strictly medical. Even the general practitioner will refer at the point when it comes to surgery. It's no, it's no, it's no longer his line. He pushes it this time around to the urologist. So there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, thank God Dr. Solomon Uafro is here. He can also throw more light for me. Thank you. I don't know if I was able to answer your question, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you have done an excellent job. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Please, can a can uh, pharmacist Okonko uh, Obo Isa ask his question? I think he's raising up his hand. Good evening, colleagues. Please, can you hear me? We are yes, having some really. network issue here. Okay, can thank you, you Dr. Timmy, for your okay. Thank you, Dr. Timmy, for that. It was very, very wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Please, uh, my, I have um, a kind of a, contrib a little contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please, um, there is something I noticed. I noticed that. Uh, there are some patients that almost all the drugs that were given to them the hospital have been reacting adversely. Yeah. And some of them actually came, up, came back and told me that they used certain meds. 
I, I, I discussed with a pharmacist from research, and he also told me that his, his, his father, his grandfather, too, was treated effectively with herbs. When he had a BPH, not processed as a BPH, that they used some herbs and he was treated very well. In there. So I want to find out is it possible for pharmacists to really go into this research? Because most times, patients really complain about the side effects of the drug we use. And it, I don't know what we can do concerning that, but I really feel we can look into it and uh, come up with something. You know, I know those in the traditional <laughs> pharmacies in the tea, 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 tea campus group. Maybe they may, if they are here, they tell us one of them. If research is ongoing concerning that, we would like to know. Because some of us are really, really interested in alternative uh, management of this case. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for that wonderful contribution. Yes, it's true. There are some um, herbal medication, like I mentioned earlier, I said the presentation, we may need to get this slide from Dr. Solomon Uma Fru's presentation. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll post it again on the platform. He, he did mention that too, he did. And there were so many um things he was mentioning yes some work for some and some people have been saying it that it works really well for them but um the question is you know in science we have to be uh it has to be scientifically proven with a lot of data it's not just uh, we have so many yeah natural like that that's the uh, but um, if there are no um Prove like that, the physician will not tell you that it doesn't work for you. But the one that they know, that is the medication, they will first tell you that even if you are taking that one, please don't stop the medication. Don't leave this one completely, even if this other one works for you. So that's what um, they will tell you. Because so many people have a lot of herb, root, this, that, that works for this, works for that. And some have even been prepared in a, you know, capsule, capsule forms, so even tablet now. And they will tell you this works for this works for that. So um, there is hardly a set. Like you said, we 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 should develop interest in. Um, I think Doctor, our national chairman Sipan is here. Uh, you you talk about tick tick and tank uh, committee to look into that. Um, is here. That's what I would say. He can. The recommendation has been made, and then. Um, he can, he can, he can oblige. Thank you very much. Then um, somebody posted on the chat that um, please next time I should separate the pictures with the, with the um, words like it didn't make it clear. Sorry, very very sorry. I didn't want us to have so much slides, so that's why I just did that. I didn't want to go more than 19 slides. Sorry for the inconvenience, but we share the slides on the platform. I hope I answered your question, sir. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> also, Dr. Solomon Umwafu, please can you ask a question? Hello. And also, Hello. 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 Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, moderator. For the opportunity, I, I must say that I'm overwhelmed from that rendition from uh, our assistant national secretary and uh, my former IPCC. Uh, she did um, a brilliant work, but there are many things that are coming out in relationship to prostrate. But if I'm, I must try to make a little reference from the rear. There was a question asked, somebody asked about the focus. Mm. Our focus is centered on the quality of life of the patient. Like I said, the aging people always come down with the poor quality of life. And the focus will principally be on the pharmacotherapy, will be on the pathophysiology, 
the psychotherapy, the supportive therapy, and principally on disease focus and management focus, which I knew Dr. Timmy has actually gone deep to explain. And that will not extricate us from going deep into the physical examination of the patient, the history taken and the laboratory backup to ascertain the baseline. Because she mentioned all these things from ab initio. And who can equally know it that this patient that would have been a backup, I know that PNB wasn't done. We know that most of them doesn't push into metastasis like cancer. But the point is, the prostate needle bias is another one that will be able to tell us to whether cancer is developing. We remember that this is an enlargement which she has actually said, when the stroma says the prostate gland based on the prostate scan is beyond 30 gram as a score, that becomes an indication there is an enlargement. And when enlargement has actually come from the static pathway, so and dynamic, there is need that alpha, five alpha reductase inhibitor is needed to be added to the fight to the normal alpha blocker. Just like um, my former IPPC said, the tamsulosin most of the times will not be able to affect the cardiovascular condition of the patient because it is principally discovered to be uroselective. It does not explore deep into isotype of alpha 1b much rather no alpha 1a rather b specifically and some part of d those ones that i explore a and c are the ones that has that tendency of causing problem with hypotension and that is the aspect where we have something like dozazosin prazosin causing that problem but tamsulosin and silodosin has been technically seen to be urologically selective. And uh, some drugs like afuzosin, which is pharmacologically uroselective in some cases. So in that case, tamsulosin remains the best and the better drug because of effect in the cardiovascular whatever is not there. Or even if it comes through diffusion from the GIP protein coupled receptor, it will be highly minimal. So there is no cause for alarm in that aspect. Then uh, in the other one, based on the question asked by whether are there other things, we discovered that aframomimile water, which is the pride of paradise, this alligator pepper has a effect equally in reducing the enlargement, but the research is ongoing. The research is equally ongoing in quiz qualis. The research is equally ongoing in Secrodaca logipi long lata, even in uh, Tapilantos baguensis. But the point is that uh, a cases like um, prostate issue, is not something like an ulcer, it's not something like an inflammation where you can easily get a plant and screen. This is a research that has a lot of uh, implications and a lot of baseline materials to carry to the end. It is not as easy and it's capital intensive. That is why some of all those things are not there. And you will not blame the physicians when they say they need a drug with already evidence-based and proven identity. And uh, based on what she said, there are a lot of claims coming from all those things. It doesn't stop from us from picking all those claims and evaluate them in the laboratory to know whether they are really working, which I know it is there, but all these things boils down to money and boils down to resources and thereabout. So then the next one is that we have actually discovered there is a study I'm carrying out now. And that study, I am beginning to know from the study that this prostrate we are talking about now is becoming a very serious thing. She's no longer aged related conditions. People from 40 years are suffering it very well. I'm coming up with a paper I want to publish, but I've not finished the research. But the research I want it to take between now and January next year because I want it to be a very large population size, whatever, so that I'll be able to get what I'm looking at. Many people from 40 years now are coming down with prostate. Many of them are coming down prostate. We begin to query what is now the problem? What is causing all these things? Why is it coming? We discover equally from all these things that people that has 
testosterone. The testosterone level is above seven are coming down with prostate conditions. Those ones, their prostate level is below because the range is three to 10 milligram per DL. So those ones, their own, nanogram per uh, milligram per DL. Those ones, their own, are coming below seven and not frequently being attacked by that post because all this thing has to do with what testosterone. So it's invariably meaning that when that enzyme, 5 alpha reductase metabolizes testosterone to dihydrotestosterone for the point of absorption, and absorption is not perpendicular with the rate of um, catabolism or the rate of breakdown. So it begins to flocculate, it begins to accumulate, it begins to enlarge. Now, if that accumulation doesn't go in relations with that, it becomes a problem. So we are now looking at, why is it that some people that testosterone is above seven to eight seems to come down with this? I'm not saying that if a man your own is up to nine and the other, but you begin to look at what is going to happen. Am I going to cut it down? But those are the things we are beginning to see now, those are things we are monitoring. Because when you observe all these things, you try to know what is going to happen. But the issue is that it's an age-related condition. No, it's not there. Even some about 15 patients that I even saw five days ago, none of them are up to 50 years. And they are like they are whatever is already enlarging. It's an, it's an issue. Then we begin to understand that there is one research that is, has not been finished. So the more you use you, uh, um, whatever loses sperm, the more that place goes down. So let that be used. There must be an issue of maybe 21 times in a month for men so that they're able to free from that. Well, I don't know what are those things. Those are the things that are coming up. So there are many things we are looking at about this. So what in a nutshell, because there are many things on top of it, as we continue, but we know that both vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, sopometo, high quality needed, antioxidant are relevant for this for the patient with prostate enlargement. They help a lot. When they are, all those things are combined together in higher concentration, the patient seems to get better quality of life as they go before they can even go to the end of going to the surgery, which is more peculiar with the people that are weak and frail because the activity is reduced. So that is a little I have to contribute for now. But I must thank Dr. Timmy for a wonderful job did this night. Thanks so much, Sam uh, Solomon for the good uh, contribution. Well done and thank you. Can you hear me? Come yes, we can. Solo. Thank yes, you for I, the Yes, I had you. Thank you. It's knowledge in passing. It was a nice content. Uh, just to me, please. There's some people that sent a question on the chat. Can you read them or I should like read them? Can you, can you read them and answer them? Or I should yes. read them out? Okay, okay. I can I can see them. I can see the questions. What does it do? The uh, rectomy have any negative effect? on male sexuality. That was the first person that sent the question from the chat there. Okay, does the autonomy have any negative effects on? Are we saying uh, okay? Um, it is not supposed to have a um, negative effect, but it's just that there's something about this condition. You know, when the man is not settled, is, is not settled, um, um, one can say uh, erectile, uh, there could be erectile dysfunction, which may not be connected to the condition, but connected to the, to the, to the mind, to the mind, because he is not happy. He has a lot of things he's, you know, handling. So um, when, if the person is happy and the person is in a good mood, all these things will just come up naturally and, you know, normal. So um, it's not supposed to, except if there is a, um, uh, if there is anything that um, happened when it is it is being done. But I notice in my facility most times when they prescribe um, either the tamsulosine, finasteride, um, avodat, and all that. Uh, sometimes they add vitamin E. Sometimes they add um, sildenafil. Sometimes they add sildenafil at low dose, so suggesting that probably this uh, patient has has not been able to um, um, 
be sexually active anymore um, is not supposed to be connected. But um, like I said, uh, being sexually active is a thing of the mind. If the person is happy, definitely there'll be an erection. But if he's moody, he's not happy, and he has something he's battling, there is no amount of erection that will come up until that issue has been has been resolved. It's an exception to um, probably cause of some of the side effects or some of the drugs that that um, they are taking. Then I also want to mention that it's not every posture that is in life that actually requires a drug. I was chatting with a urologist the other day and he told me that um, it is not all patients that come with BPH that he actually treats, that some of them are not his uh, you know, candidates. If the size is not so big and they are not down with the signs and the, and the, and the, and the symptoms, then they are not his uh, um, you know, candidates. He actually sends them but even though there is a kind of enlargement, but no matter the size of the enlargement, if they are done with the signs and the symptoms, then you begin to place them on a, on a drug. So it's not every enlargement. You see, some of them have been living with enlargement for long and they, they have no symptom. There's no sign, there's no symptom and they are doing well. We don't, we, we, there's no need for you to say, oh, you should be on drug. Come, come, come and see the urology or come and see this thing. But if you, unless he is done, he is done with it, then you can, uh, we can start them on a medication. Like we said, medication is the first line. Yeah, it's after that. If there's any anything that um, we can be talking about surgery, so um, it's not supposed to be connected except there's a mistake somewhere, or the person is far older and is bothered about the problem. Dr. Solomon is always there to help me if I didn't get them correctly. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Then some other person um, talked about um, why you... I think about lifestyle modification. Someone was asking of lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification in the management of BPH. Um, so multiple that may improve the symptoms of the of the BPH and also the reduce the inflammation. They give, they they want to give it in order to rule out any infection. And then level flows are still seem to be the drug of choice for for it, even in my facility. That's what they give. That's what they give. Then there's another thing that has lifetime modification. In the management of BPH. Yes, last, yes, last time modification, Dr. Mafu already, yes, he already okay. talked about that. He talked about lifestyle modification. In fact, for all many, all disease conditions, uh, lifestyle yeah. modification. But if um, um, the older you get is a risk factor, being a male is a risk factor for this condition and the older you get B is also a risk factor. Even though now we, we see younger males um, coming down with it. I think it has to do with lifestyle. Most of the things most young ones do now, most of the things they do now, they are not waiting for when they ought to do the things they are doing now. So they're taking a lot of things. Taking, so that's why you, you see the diagnosis. There are a lot of uh, diagnoses to kind of differentiate whether it is really BPH. There are a lot of, because there are a lot of other conditions that can make the symptom look exactly the same. So the differential diagnosis is what we tell if it is BPH, if the person is younger. I heard of a 26 year old boy, a guy, man, 26 year old man. And then um, I think I was interested in that folder. We were, we were, we were looking at it and then um, we found out that differential diag uh, diagnosis was saying something else. But the truth is that, yes, it can happen. One in um, um, very few years, it could be a, a, then there's a contribution. They yeah, say, well, I think the prostatectomy has a slight effect on erectile dysfunction because the prostate gland contributes about 30% of the seminal fluid. And when removed can have some consequences. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. There's a, there are two other people raising up hands. 
Donc, ok, euh, nous quatre ans quand j'étais. A des sous-commis. Ça y est, ça peut changer. The moderator. Um, I would like us to take only two of these questions so that we can finish and do other things. Yes, yes. I'll tell us what I will try to conclude. Yes, it will start in this order. Um, pharmacies, Adenigi, um, will speak. Then we'll give the floor to our chairman. Yes, to make his contribution and we'll wrap up. Thank you. We are due to that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good evening. Yes, I'm speaking. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, good evening. There you go. You can speak on. All right. Thank you so much, um, pharmacist uh, Timmy, for a good presentation. Um, please, I have a question. Recently, I've been seeing that um, some people come come with uh, symptoms that are consistent with that of BPH. <laughs> And in a community setting, we we'll usually tell them, okay, go and do PSA, that's a um, prostate okay. specific antigen test. Yeah. So they come up with prostate specific antigen test that's even one or even less than sometimes one, between one and two, which is that is still within the normal range. But you can see all the symptoms. And we give them the antibiotics to treat. Um, symptoms of urinary tract infection and it's still not receding. So does it mean that you can have BPH without a rise in PSA? I want that clarification, please. I don't know if you get my question. Hello, Dr. Timip. Can you hear him? Yes. Hello. Yes, okay. yes, I got his question. I got okay. his question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, yes, you know, one thing about this uh, post trace specific ant antigen is found in the blood and is a protein made by the, by the post trace gland. So um, it's true. The, the 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 measurements of the of of it can is supposed to indicate that whether there is. But like we said before, the PSA is not enough for us to ascertain. This person is already having the symptoms. We've talked about the symptoms, and that's why we are even learning about it. For those of us in the community setting, even in the hospital setting, this person already comes down with the symptoms. So that is. Um, something to let you know. Now, just the PSA alone is not enough. There are other, if it's in the hospital site, we talked about um, physical examination. We, uh, um, uh, we have the one for the outpatient setting and the one for the inpatient setting. You may need to examine. You can also send the person for a digital rectal examination too, to find out if there is, um, uh, this in order for you to commence any medication. But to commence a medication when it has not been ascertained is um, um, what I think may not be good because there are other certain conditions that can make somebody have those lower urinary tract symptoms and it resembles BPH. And that is where there are differential diagnoses. If you say the PSA was okay, but the symptoms is there glaring and you, are, you can see then there are other things that we may need to review. That was what we did for this case study. A lot of questions we have to come to mind. What has this person been taking over the counter drug? Are you on any other medication? Are you on any herbal drug? Are you on this or that? We need to ascertain all that. We need to really ascertain before we can conclusively say this. Otherwise, this person could just be referred to, to a uh, urologist or a general practitioner, if you cannot perform this physical examination. Where Dr. Solomon was talking, he was even encouraging us, yes, we can. We should, we should get to the point where we can even do physical examination. Okay, somebody just posted on the chat. That is not a confirmatory test. So, so that is it. There are other, other diagnoses you can do for you to say yes. 
this person is down. It's not just with the symptom. There are differential diagnoses that, that, that we differentiate it. Yeah, thank you. Well done, yeah, the moderator, you can go ahead, yeah. Uh, let's speak and Dr. Joseph Madi. Is this not present? Can you move to the top? Yes, good evening, everyone. Please, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can, yes, hear, we you can hear you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, the presenter and everyone that is in this meeting tonight. I'm happy when I looked at uh, the attendance. About 60 people, no, sorry, yes, six, yes, at so least 60. Six, about 60 something, about 65 then. Yes, and uh, I want to recognize everyone in this meeting tonight, but I want to re uh, especially recognize somebody I've, I know, and he's the Dean of Pharmacy in the University of Port Harcourt, uh, Professor Sidney Aproko, I saw him around there was a time he logged out and later he came in again they are the people that train pharmacists and i'm happy we know urology pharmacy group is new in nigeria and i have a question this night anyway dr timi was saying that uh, there are times there are explanations that the general practitioner may have something to do and so he will refer to a urologist. Of course, we know that a urology is a branch of surgery. It's part of surgery and um, uh, everything about it. Then we have urology pharmacists around the world. And I know that urology pharmacists are trained to supervise prescribed therapies and to provide a higher quality patient care. But I want to find out from uh, while encouraging urology pharmacies of Nigeria and what they are doing, I want to find out from the presenter if there is a time whereby we will not, that's an ordinary pharmacist who is not a urology pharmacist like myself. If there is a time we I can say, okay, I can refer to a urology pharmacist. Is there any time? And in what situations will that happen? That myself, that I'm not a urology pharmacist, we like to refer to a urology pharmacist. I know this also has to do with the person who was asking question on what should be our focus. I don't know if you understand my question, Ma. Yes, I did. Yes, sir, I did. Um, uh, thank you very much, sir. Our national chairman, Dr. Joseph Madu, for coming for, to this presentation and for asking this question. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you. Yes, we are looking forward to um, a time where um, pharmacists, urology pharmacists of um, um, Nigeria, we have, I mean, pharmacists who are specialized in urology will have defined role and what and what to do. It's not any too different from what is done in uh, nephrology or um, cardiology or even critical care. Because what they do, I know in critical care is that when a patient is critically ill and the patient is on admission, and then the nurses are playing their role, the physicians are playing their role. The nurses are there also with their, with their scrub. Um, if there are dilutions made to the drugs to be administered, they are the ones that do it. Like for oncology uh, patients that need a lot of dilutions in their, in their medications, is the pharmacists that, that, are, that stand there, that are by their side, that do all those things and help them. But, but then when it, comes to fixing um, naso um, gastric tube i think it's just the is the that's the work of the of the of the nurses even to so um, the our role has our role in connection to the drugs 
um, administering and making sure that um, um, working in collaboration at patient bedside with their scrub, fully dressed in collaboration, like the picture I, I, I was trying to show, then that picture was for uh, a patient and everybody sat down and they were analyzing what should be done, what should be done and asking questions from the physician, from the um, pharmacist and the uh, uh, nursing station. Why the nurses give you pharmacists who go there to make sure that these drugs are administered the way it should be administered watching out for side effects and also retrieving and informing the physician. So where uh, an ordinary pharmacist who is not specialized in urology will refer to a pharmacist who is specialized in urology, I think it would be possible with time. It would be possible with time because it's, it's already happening with, in cases like um, nephrology. When such cases you refer. Now that pharmacist who is specialized in nephrology or this thing knows the other team members that they work with, the physicians, the nurses that they can do together and work together. So that's how I can answer that question. I, 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 I don't know, but we look forward to a time where, uh, but I know that just like uh, uh, Dr. Ujin asked before, that's where it's going to our focus. It's um, if we are able to, um, um, how will I put it? Align these things in the specialty. Even knowing that even right now, say urology, um, overseas, I was trying to look at what they do in um, other countries apart from Nigeria that we've never really stood well. Uh, it's the collaboration thing. It's the collaboration thing. I don't know if uh, Doctor uh, Obo Ita has something to say about this, but I can see your hands up. I Yes, thank you, Dr. Timmy. Uh, please, I just want to add a uh, little something okay. based on the question our national chairman asked. Um, uh, what I want to say is that, you know, urology pharmacy group just came. However, before that group was formed, coming from the community pharmacy, and you see that Go there ahead. are many communities. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Yes, coming from the, the community pharmacy, and you know, there are many community pharmacies who have actually trained themselves out of their pocket, from their pocket, to specialize in the monitoring, management, and even um, the detection of um, prostate health and co. So, um, um, we have pharmacies who have been there. It's just that the association is just coming up and as a body, okay. we are just trying to bring these people together. For example, okay. I can give you a case in point where we, we, we had a patient, a, a, a patient who, who had prostate cancer and then mm -hmm. almost all the drugs that were given to him were not working. So, we had to do our research. We came up with a particular drug. We met the urologist, and initially he, 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 he refused. He, 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 he did not want to accept. So we met another urologist, and he said, "Okay, fine, let's try it out." Incidentally, that drug is what that patient is still using today to manage that cancer. Very cheap, and um, the patient quality of life has really improved you know, as compared to when he was on the other drugs. So we have pharmacists who are into it already. We okay. get referrals, but the, the, the body now is trying to organize all these people, whether you are from community, whether you are in the hospital, or which other. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for that information. So uh, Dr. Thank Joseph Madden, question has been answered, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, congratulations. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Simi, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, my, I call him my girl at the top, Dr. Mm -hmm. Solomon. I'm not surprised with your explanation. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in tonight's. Um, it's, it's like, uh, sorry, it's like Dr. Solomon, Solomon has something to say about this. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the another opportunity. I, I, I saw from the chat box. Maybe we did not look through it. Somebody was like asking latex um, catheter and silicon catheter. Which one is better? I don't know whether we read something about that. Uh, I don't know whether the person that asked that question is still there. Is uh, I saw just saw it now. Yes. Okay. okay. Silicon catheter is better when there is obstructive uropathy. The point is, is less injurious and is less irritative. That's just one primary thing about it. It doesn't cause so much pain. It doesn't cause so much stress. Uh, it, the flow is faster, either suprapubic or normal intralumina. So it is better compared to the other one, latex or whatever. And uh, there is another question of asking why levofloxacin is used most often. Nobody shows, says that levofloxacin is the best line drug to use. But you know very well that there is always a urosepsis. And when there is a urosepsis, the best drug to use is urinary antiseptics, either nitrofurantoin. And try to know that levofloxacin is a semi-synthetic drug isolated from the quinolones. The primary drug in use in urosepsis is nalidisic acid, which is a quinolone. Only when the structure is fluorinated at the position six, it becomes more active and more effective from there. There is an advancement to the third generation. So because it's uroselective in terms of urosepsis activity, it is better with respect to their volume of distribution and their sensitivity in tackling any microorganism. I'll be responsible for that urogenital problems. So that is how that is particular one for that. And based on the referral that our national chairman said, well, I would say uh, Yupon is not doing badly. It's not doing badly. Uh, remember that this area is an abstract area that people don't want to come to. Just like another area in pharmacy like uh, anesthetics, they run away from it. I know there was a day I gave a lecture on an anesthetics. The, the anesthesiology that we are there, we are just looking at me. Those who pharmacists know something about anesthetics like this, I thought they don't know anything about it. I said, what are you talking about? In any way, drug is involved. Pharmacist is involved. Don't believe that they, they have not come to that place that they don't know anything about. So we are coming up. And I believe we, we are coming up. We, we are growing. We are growing. The referral will definitely come. What matters about referring anything is the value. We give a value system to ourselves. Most of the times, inferiority complex becomes our problem. You see somebody that might have much knowledge than you, maybe from the vertical angle or from the horizontal angle, say, for me to refer to my colleague, it's better I refer to a physician. At the end of the day, your colleague may even do much better than that physician or surgeon. Yes. So yes, when we begin true. to talk to ourselves, and that's when we begin to have the gains of the collaborative that's care. True. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you much, so Dr. Solomon, for your contribution and the brief uh, remark. Thank you, everyone, for Thank the you, attendance, Abby. for being there throughout the, program, throughout the presentation, the question and answer section. If can uh, Pharmacy Zita give a brief closing remark, then uh, Mr. Debayo, this is the executive, was the first person to be to call, come into the uh, this is the uh, program. He should give us the closing prayer. Then then uh, this guy, pharmacist Ghanaia Arowo Shaye, also she just give us the closing prayer before we end the program. Please. Okay. Um. Let Thank me say something before we conclude. Um, pharmacist. You can just give us a closing, brief closing remark before the prayer session. Uh, pharmacist, Sita, can I say something before you continue? Um, okay, you can go ahead. I want to thank every one of us, Pharmacy Sita, Doctor Timmy, Doctor Solomon, Doctor Abbas Ibrahim, everyone that have contributed in one way or the other. And I want to say, urology pharmacies of Nigeria, we are evolving. We are we are taking our baby steps. We know before the end of this, we would have put ourselves together to put our presentation in models form so that we can train pharmacists with the help of um, um, other institutions to get um, a kind of training, uh, what I call Euro clinical training that we'll have 
for clinical pharmacists. Um, I want us to, uh, if you take note of our presentation so far, you see that our presentation is a kind of build up of the previous one, just like um, Dr. Timmy uh, and uh, Dr. Solomon's presentation. And you see her making reference to Dr. Solomon's presentation. Um, mm. I want to encourage us, if you are presenting, let it be a kind of build up based on the area that you are treating. Um, somebody asked mm -hmm. a question on prostatectomy, and I want to say it will affect our sexuality depending on the patient and mm -hmm. the um, um, surgery, the procedure itself. If it is nerve sparing, um, it could either be nerve sparing or not. But if it is, it can affect some nerves that innervate the cavernosum, and that can affect um, erection. Um, if you are blacks, research has shown that blacks are more affected after the surgery than the white and the Hispanic and age as well contributes. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, Pharmacist Ita, I like calling you Dr. Ita. I know very soon <laughs> you celebrate with you. Um, can you uh, continue from here? Thank you everyone. Thank you, fam. All right. Once again, thank you very much. Um, my God, I, I said I, I really want to appreciate everybody for many Actually, at some point, it was as if uh, the urology group was uh, in that. Speak up, and uh, we want to assure everyone that this presentation will continue as arranged. So, and we are also soliciting the support of everybody. We come to you for advice. Please, we also we are begging you to come to our aid when we come to you. We want to thank the national chairman and uh, Dr. Wafuru, Dr. Timmy, the presenter and others present. So um, once again, I want to say thank you everyone. Please moderator, you can continue. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Pharmacy Zita. Please can, uh, if Mr. Debayo is the there to give us closing prayer and uh, Pharmacy Zani at Karo Ishai. First, uh, Mr. Debayo is the should give us the closing prayer, please. Is it still online? They are both still on, they are both online. Hello, please. Pharmacist, are they by your editor? Is it still around? Hello? Can you hear me, please? Hello? Hello, Pharmacist, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, Hello. I'm still online. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, please. Good evening. 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 Who can go on? Who can give us the closing prayer again? The second person. Pharmacist Zara Woshaye, please can you go on to give us the closing prayer? Then I find another person for the. It was his only two day just ever around. After the pharmacist Ghanaia should give us the closing prayer. Okay. Hello. You are around good. I'm on give now. us the I'm around okay. now. Okay. You give us the closing prayer, then pharmacist Ghania should also give us the closing prayer too on our side. Hey, so Ghania on the line now. You can give us the closing prayer, then then pharmacist Ghania you do after you. Okay. Mm. Hello, good evening, Thank everybody. Good, good evening. evening. We thank God for today's presentation. We thank God for the life of the organizers and the presenter of this program. In fact, she has really presented very well. We mm. thank the general organizer of the immunology pharmacies of Nigeria for all what we've learned today. We pray God for retentive memory so that we can be able to put it into practical use 
for the benefit of our patients to improve their life and expected outcome from them. We want mm -hmm. Almighty to go to be with our families so that we'll be able to be organizing more of this. May God accept our prayers. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pamaj. Please, Pamaj Sadibaya is Victor. He's raising up his. Pamaj Sadibaya is Victor. Can you hear me? Pamaj Sadibaya is Victor. Please, can you give us the closing prayer? Pamaj Sadibaya is Victor. You can't hear me. He is still on, uh, has not muted himself. Yes. He has not, and he's still raising yeah. up, he's even really raising up his hand. Come on, Daddy Bayer, is this up? Okay. He's still, he's still. Please, he's, he's pharmacist, uh, Olu Tunde Joseph Aran. Pharmacist Olu Tunde, Olu Tunde Joseph, is he Aran? Just watch me pray, please, can you give us the closing prayer? Okay. Yeah, so in Jesus' name. Okay. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for making it possible for us to gather here this evening. We've been deliberating, we have been learning, we are here to learn a lot, and then we are hoping and praying and begging that and this group that has just started, you Royal Ye Pharmacist of Nigeria, we go from strength to strength. And we are hoping mm -hmm. that we are praying that and we are going to do things that will make us we will learn a lot to help us to not just learn it, to apply all the things we've learned, put into practice in our various mm -hmm. institutions. We mm -hmm. ask you for all this. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah, good night. Good night. I'm just saying my.